Hi there. So today we're going to talk about how tornadoes work. I'm going to try to keep things moving pretty quickly and I try to keep myself at least in the view a little bit because I know just watching a voice over slides is the literal worst. Um, that being said, also, uh, I'm going to use Edpuzzle to ask some questions along the way. I think most of you are familiar since Mr. Doyle and I have used this uh, pretty heavily in general chemistry last year, and so it should be pretty easy. At the end of today, you're going to have some quick questions over this lecture, and then the rest of your day will be uh, free to you. This is Dr. Fujita, specifically the guy with the glasses here in the plane. And there are a lot of scientists in this field. There are a lot of scientists in meteorology. Uh, there's actually been a lot of meteorologists who turned into scientists in other fields as well. A great example is John Dalton from chemistry, who would like the foundation guy, the guy who came up with the idea of atoms, right? Like big deal in chemistry, uh, started off by being a meteorologist. And there, there are a lot of other examples like that in terms of like people who study magnetism, for instance. But Fujita is probably the big one in terms of people who stayed a meteorologist. And unquestionably the biggest scientist in this field. And if we're talking about tornadoes, we can't do anything but start with Dr. Fujita. This is the father of severe weather research for real. And you can see him here in his map room. So before there were computers, how maps were distributed was by fax. Someone would draw a weather map, like you've done in my class, that process of isoplothing, and they would fax it out every so often, and they would get clipped onto boards. It was called the map room. And a lot of different uh, colleges had map rooms like this. Um, actually, even in Creighton, there was still a map room. Now we had turned it into a digital thing, but this wasn't that weird. I do want to point out like that exercise in dry maps is hard. And imagine, you know, this was being done on scales from like every few hours, every day for multiple years. You can imagine how many maps there were. Data that was at the cutting edge, right? It's not like, sell this short. This was a ton of work and it worked well. It just is a lot easier to do with the internet. And without Dr. Fujita, we probably wouldn't know as much about severe weather as we would otherwise. Uh, he was definitely fundamental in this subject. Fujita isn't a stranger to tornadoes and destruction, but not because he grew up in an area with uh, tornadoes. He grew up in Japan. And he was a young engineer at the time of World War II, and he was dispatched to places like, this is Tokyo, after the fire bombings. If you don't know about the fire bombings, actually, it's a good subject to kind of dive into. It's one of the great war crimes the United States committed in World War II. We firebombed these cities made of wood, and the death tolls were uh, on par with, like, the atomic bombings. We don't talk about them as much in terms of, like, the targeting of civilians and things that were probably questionable in that war. But Fujita would come into these cities and do damage surveys and try to figure out how the firestorm progressed through the city and do kind of a post-catastrophe analysis. And he was sent into places like Hiroshima as well and to study exactly what this weapon was and how it worked and work backwards to its destructive potential, right? Because the Japanese didn't have an atomic bomb and they knew this wasn't a conventional weapon. And so Fujita and a lot of other engineers came into these fields um, knowing a lot of math and tried to work backwards. Fujita also had a fascination with weather, and when he was doing this, recognized pictures of American tornado damage and thought that the atomic bomb damage and the tornado damage looked similar. Now, I've juxtaposed an extremely famous picture of tornado damage up top from Joplin and down below from Hiroshima, and you can see there are a lot of parallels, right? Your strongest structures do remain, but everything else is kind of wiped. And I'm sure Fujita wasn't the only one to make this connection but it stuck with him for a long time. Um, you know, Fujita was, was devastatingly interested in weather, even as, as an engineer. And um, yeah, eventually he travels to the United States knowing that it's the only spot he can study tornadoes. But this early exposure to the atomic bombings and fire bombings is fundamental to why he was able to make the discoveries he was. I think without uh, seeing destruction in this kind of systemic way, uh, the odds are Fujita wouldn't have made some of the uh, final like ideas that he came up with like the jump here is, is pretty important so Fujita was special when Fujita left Tokyo to fly to he ended up in San Francisco and is going to Chicago in the end uh, you couldn't just like take a jet right it's 1953 when he he leaves Japan you had to like take a plane an island hop to get to the United States and Fujita had never flown in a plane before. And so obviously that's a, a massively cool experience even now. 
Um, but you know, here you are, a weather nerd flying from Japan to the United States, and Fujita is great at drawing maps, and he maps everything in his life. And so here's his like, you know, again, he's not a meteorologist at this time. He's very much not a classically trained meteorologist now mapping out his flight between these places. You can see like when he's asleep, he doesn't have data, but when he's awake, he's like mapping out what the different clouds look like at different times across. It's gorgeous. And you know, I want to point out, these are like hand drawn maps. Like, like, I don't know. I just, I, I find this just like, I can see myself doing this and I can see all my nerd friends who'd like weather doing this. This is awesome. Right. And Fujita keeps this up through his whole life. Like, he loved trains and travel. And so what he would do is he'd like map his travels out of, he was based in Chicago, to different places in the United States. And he would do so on what looks like to me to be like weather maps. I know. I, I really appreciate this. Like that he's speaking a language and way of seeking the world that, that I recognize and uh, appreciate. What Fujuda had in his tools that other people didn't at the time were these small little one engine planes, right? Fujita had the idea that right after a tornado, you could contract a plane like this to fly over the damage path and take pictures. Now, that wasn't the only thing he did, but this was what revolutionized his ideas. By taking aerial pictures of tornado damage, he was able to understand patterns within that damage. Uh, this was huge. Uh, part of that's because Fujita already had enough notoriety to like get extra funding. Like Obviously, chartering planes isn't cheap. But part of this was also just Fujita being intelligent. Um, you know, one had really thought to do things this way. Uh, the other thing is Fujita thought of tornadoes as leaving their fingerprints right afterwards. So he wanted to see as much as he could, as fast as he could, because he knew people would start cleaning up the debris, which you would hope if your house got hit by a tornado, like you want to start understanding what you have and have lost. Like, but if we're to, uh, we're to study it, we need as much data as fast as we can get. So Fujita made this idea. And he would start taking pictures of tornado damage from the air and publishing them in like these really exhaustive case studies. Because what he would do after he had all the damage pictures, he would go down on the ground and take as many pictures as he could. Remember, this is before the time of cell phones or digital cameras. There aren't a lot of people who like geotag things on the Snapchat map saying, hey, here's what happened to my house. Like to know what happened, you had to be on the ground before it cleaned up. And then he would go like house to house to house and interview people. Like, what did you see? What did it feel like? What did it sound like? This very clinical thing. Like, yo, your house just got destroyed, but can you tell me about that tornado? I'm really interested in learning about that tornado. Right? But he would do that with his students. And this is how we started to understand tornadoes from like a wide perspective. Because before then, they weren't particularly well understood or well studied. Right? They were kind of just understood to be like smaller phenomena. Uh, like lows or something. I mean, this is a little bit oversimplifying, but Fujita really is the first to do these like exhaustive, exhaustive studies. And I'll be honest, like Fujita for all his work, a lot of scientists didn't like it. You know, he was making claims like there were downdrafts. We've talked a lot about downdrafts in this class already. They weren't accepted things like microburst and downburst phenomena. Scientists did not like that. They did not think damaging winds could be downbath based. There's just no observational reason to think they would be. Of course, there are, but it took like 20 years to prove. And then Fujita goes and says things like, well, actually, a tornado isn't a single structure. There's probably multiple vortexes within most tornadoes, especially strong tornadoes. And we should really work on studying that structure. That was a big no-no. And he was really shunned from a lot of scientific communities for making that kind of hypothesis. And then he starts taking pictures from the air that prove that. And they start taking pictures on the ground that prove that. And kind of like Mendeleev with the periodic table, he was making these predictions before the observations, and then he found the observations to back him up. At some point, he becomes very popular because, holy crap, this guy had figured it out and could prove he had figured it out. That makes sense. Like, it took a long time for him to be accepted, but once he was accepted, he became incredibly popular. Um, he's certainly the most well-known meteorologist. It's not even close. We're going to talk more about this stuff in this picture here in a while, in the next lecture, probably. Now, we'll get back to that for a while, but Fujita's big discovery, at least to us in this class, is that if we want to study tornadoes, we can't actually study them directly. To be clear, we try to study them directly. These are two pictures of tornado intercept probes. The one on the left is a Twist-X probe. Uh, no, excuse me, that's from Tor. 
Uh, so the one on the left is, uh, with the smoke coming out of it, is a really large scale uh, experiment that base weighs like 300 or 400, 400 pounds. Uh, you can see there's like four handles. So scientists would like roll that out of the back of the truck. It's got like wind measuring instruments called anemometers and a lot of barometers and some cameras on it. And then the little conical thing there was really a video probe. Um, the guy running away from that, his name was Tim Samaras. He was killed by a tornado uh, in El Reno, Oklahoma. But the problem with these probes is you need to drop them down in the path of the tornado, get them where the tornado is going to hit, which is surprisingly difficult. That's the really hard part. And then safely get away. And then you have to go back and find the probe, which sometimes gets thrown. It's not a great thing to do. It's hard to do. And the tornado needs to be long enough lived to do it. So we're not going to measure the wind speeds inside of a tornado unless we do this. And this is really, really hard. Um, speaking as someone who has tried to get in front of tornadoes a couple times, you're not going to do this very often. I mean, and you, you do run a, a very real risk, um, you know, long term. Yeah, I might try to do this some more in my own life, but like, we're not going to measure tornadoes directly. What Fujita recognized, kind of thinking back to his time in Hiroshima, is that we need to study what the tornado does. And you have to study the damage to understand what it happened. And to be clear, tornado damage is generally pretty isolated. Like, take a look at this neighborhood. This is this is indicative. And kind of like superimpose where you live, because this neighborhood looks relatively representative of kind of like uh, middle class Americana, which is where a lot of our students come from. You know, you've got a couple suburban blocks here, right? And it's really only taken out like one street worth of houses. You see that? Like kind of imagine your house and how far you'd have to walk to see that. That's pretty common. It's not all tornadoes, but this is a pretty common tornado. This is a pretty strong tornado here. Um, just looking at it, I would assume this was ranked F4 at first glance. So if we can study this tornado damage, uh, we can understand how the tornado was acting. This isn't ideal. Right? Because, let's face it, buildings aren't designed to be tornado damage indicators, right? No one's designing a building like, boy, if a tornado hits this, can we study how fast the winds are going? Like, that's that's not good. Two, buildings are built differently. Some people build the building better than others, down to contractors or the brand of nail or where the trees that built the lumber came from or what the conditions were when the mortar was set on those cinder blocks or what the soil stabilization was like or was it wet or dry when the tornado... There's so many variables that go into building strength um, let alone the actual building itself, let alone like the orientation of the building relative to the tornado, relative so many things that could make this the structure be destroyed or not. It's not ideal. We'd much rather just get measurements from the tornado, but we, we can't. And so we're going to do the best thing we can, which is to measure the damage. So here you're looking at a relatively long track of a tornado. It looks like maybe I don't know, a third to three quarters of a mile wide, not quite a mile wide in certain spots, but certainly a wider tornado than most. But if you look carefully, it doesn't really hit a lot of structures. It's really going through a lot of trees and some fields. It does look like there's a couple road crossings along there, but that whole path there is relatively undeveloped, which is really good. We don't want the tornado to hit anything, let's be very clear. But if we want to measure it, trees and fields don't hold up to tornadoes particularly well. And we don't really know a lot about the strength. And so uh, a tornado that's stronger, by definition, has to hit something. If the tornado doesn't hit something, we can't measure it. And that something has to be a structure for the most part. I mean, trees give us some information, but really the tornado damage is based on structural damage. So if the tornado misses things, we're going to rate it lower than if it hits things. So personally, I never want to see an F5 tornado because that means it's done catastrophic damage to something, right? By definition, it's already uh, a very strong and damaging tornado. I'd rather see only F0 tornadoes because that means it didn't do any damage to anyone's buildings, right? So Fujita himself comes up with a scale and working from math and some of his observations from atomic bombings and things, he assigns wind speeds to these different categories of damaging from kind of like minor damage at F0 to what he called incredible damage at F5. He actually assumed there would be the possibility of an F6, although mathematically winds of that speed don't seem to be possible. Um, we certainly have never observed them, let's put it that way. Um, I am not really a believer in anything higher than an F5, I'll be very direct. So he comes up with a scale, and this scale wouldn't have been adopted if it weren't uh, come up with right before like one of the biggest tornado outbreaks in history. So there's this really damaging, violent outbreak, and Fuji just got this new scale, and it, the news media goes, hey, we can say, like, the Xenia, Ohio tornado, that was an F5. What's an F5? Well, this guy, Ted Fujita, he knows about tornadoes, and he's got the scale for saying how, right, it was fortuitous. 
So that's what the S stands for. Now, this is kind of interesting because it does lead to a problem. We just learned you can measure wind speeds with a radar. This, this here is an F5 tornado by wind speeds. If you look at this tornado, it's got 212 mile an hour winds. I know that. Actually, I actually think it was 224. Hold on, it's down here. Uh, uh, 220, yeah, 224 miles an hour. So that doesn't match with Gia, but it does the EF5. We are measuring this as an F5 tornado. This was in El Reno again, the, the one that killed Tim Samaras, the storm chaser, right? We measured it. We know the wind speeds were F5, right? We actually measured it multiple ways. Here is a, a Doppler on a truck, right? So this whole thing is from, you can actually see there's two different vortexes here, right? The two different couplets. It's absolutely gorgeous. You've got the satellite tornado back here and then the main tornado here. This is just stunning data to me. Like, I can't believe we have radar data that's good kind of thing. Like, you know, this is beautiful. You know, we have two different independent measurements saying this is an F5 tornado. And yet, you know, this is the worst that the El Reno tornado did. That's not F5 damage. That structure is still intact. It's not wiped. It's still on its original foundation. That's not an F5. And this is, again, the worst damage it did. We can't rate it in F5. Even though we measured it, it's like we know the winds were more than 200 miles an hour. This is a damage-based scale. And to be consistent, El Reno was an F3. What that means immediately is there are tornadoes that are stronger than we rate them. But because they did not hit something strong enough to survive the tornado, or they did not hit something at all, we don't rank as strongly. That's a huge problem in terms of being objective. But if we acknowledge this is a damage-based scale and not a scientific wind measurement, that's really helpful. Oh, well, this is different than hurricanes. In a hurricane, we fly a plane into the hurricane. You see that big tube behind the guy, right? Right here by the toolbox. You take this instrument called a drop sand. You drop it through this tube and it goes into the hurricane and it measures the wind speeds. We know the wind speeds. It is directly measured. The hurricane lasts long enough that we can keep measuring it. We rate a hurricane based on what we know, not based on what it will do, not based on its damage that it does, but based on measurements. We call it the Saffir Simpson scale, whatever. Okay. The Fujita scale is not the Saffir Simpson scale. Our ratings can't account for things that don't get hit. We have a great example. This is in a national forest. You can see these trees all snapped uniformly in the same direction. This was a weak tornado. Probably. We don't actually know how strong this tornado was because these trees all failed at F2 damage, right? They didn't, they couldn't stand up to a stronger tornado. If an F5 came through here, it would look identical. So we have to acknowledge that our measurements here are flawed to some level. Over time, we studied them, and it became clear that Fujita was a little wrong on his wind speeds. He was off by about a factor of a third. Uh, what we do now is called degree of damage. And so on the left here, you'll see the EXP LBUB. So uh, EXP is the actual wind speed, and LB and UB are the lower and upper bounds. So let's say you want to break windows. The average wind speed that it breaks windows is 96 miles an hour. And anywhere from 79 to 114 miles an hour is what's going to happen. So once you've broken windows, if the wind's over 114 miles an hour, it doesn't matter because all the windows are going to break anyway. If your exterior walls collapse, it doesn't matter how good they are. After 150 miles an hour, your walls are going to collapse. But if your walls collapse, you know it was less or the winds had to be greater than 113 miles an hour. And we did this by studying a lot of measurements, a lot of damage, right? The advanced Fujita scale is much more scientific than the original Fujita scale. Specifically, there are like 28 different things that you can measure damage on. Most of them you'll notice are wood frame structures, houses, barns, hotels, apartment, fast food, you, you name it. You know, we're talking like stud based drywall construction, right? You'll notice these are most of the things that exist in humankind. Uh, as a matter of fact, everything is uh, human-made except for degree damages 27 and 28, which are trees. And the trees are divided between, like, pine trees and oak trees, right? Okay. Most of the things that we really are going to try to see are going to be houses, right, and, like, a masonry structure. So if you have, like, a, a, what's a good example? Like a, a hotel or a hospital or something like that that's got, you know, a less traditional construction, that might give us more resilience toward a tornado. 
Schools are great for this as well. Uh, schools generally last longer than a house in a tornado because of the way they're built. And so as you look at this, you'll see that there isn't that many different kinds of buildings. And uh, if we're going to study how things work, we, we kind of look at what it is and you click on that item and it tells you all the different things that could happen. Well, did the windows get blown out? Did the walls get blown out? Is the roof missing? Blah, 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 blah. Here's the wind speeds. So it's a little bit more scientific than just like looking at the damage saying, okay, F1, F2, F3, right? We actually have some measurements now. The people who make these measurements uh, are only meteorologists with the National Weather Service. So they go out, they have like an iPad or a Blackberry or whatever, and they look at the damage and they say, okay, windows gone, yes or no? Walls gone, yes or no? Has the building been sheared off the foundation? Is the, the, the building been slapped? Whatever, right? And they, they go through and they, they take that measurement for that building. And then they do it for every building in the tornado path. So it takes a little bit of time. So this is more Oklahoma. Uh, this is an F5 tornado's path. And you can see all of the dots represent the different F ratings of that tornado from 1 to 5 or 0 to 5, right? And every single building they had to go through and do that checklist on. So you can kind of see these corridors of damage. And once you're done with that, you can work backwards. And you can see all of these different dots here are data points from that same tornado. Put a different way. You were looking at that like core right here, the subdivision that got hit. And then the trial can be ranked. So in this like green area, that's an F1. And this red area is an F4. And the, the F5 is actually right in here only. So the F5 damage was shortly lived. But I want you to point out these are like human made judgments of the damage. Uh, it's not like they're objectively ranked. It takes a little bit of time to do this. Here is, in that same thing, a trial by Kansas City. So you know how to read the map on the left now. It's a couplet map, right? And you can see how well that couplet map corresponds to the trail path. And you can see this trail was on the ground for a very long time. And that it did a lot of like F2, F3 damage. And the only F4 damage in this case was up here at Linwood, right? About I'll show you here on the map of the velocities it goes again. So this is F1, F2, F1, F3, F2, F3, F2, F4, F3, F1. Okay. It doesn't look like that on the velocity map though, right? If I look at that velocity map, I can't tell the different amounts of damage. I can only see when the trail looks the most scary. I can actually tell you when that is to me as a meteorologist with a lot of eyes. It's right about there. So I don't think the most dangerous part of this tornado hit anything. As a matter of fact, I'm positive the most dangerous part of this tornado didn't hit anything. I know that because I watched this entire tornado for over an hour. This is my view of it. The tornado was wrapped in rain. You can't see the tornado. Um, so that's scary. Uh, I've seen a lot of tornadoes, right? I'm on 60 or so. This is an F5 in my books. Um, I'm quite positive of that. If this were to have hit structures at this point, there's there's no way. This thing is massive. It's brutal. Um, so I want to point out that not every tornado that's an F5 intensity is rated an F5. There just was nothing here that got hit. Um, again, I've seen enough of these. I, I just can tell you this is this is an F5. Uh, I do want to point out that it's a little weird, and like I don't want to speak like as authority. I'm not trained in ranking damage. But I've seen a lot of damage. These are my own pictures from uh, the tornado there at the bottom. It was an F4. Um, at some point, you become pretty good and pretty familiar with damage. And you know that tornadoes don't always get ranked what they did. Um, for instance, I think up here, this was only ranked in F2, even though it's very clearly higher than F2 damage. Um, it's a long story. And so I don't want you to take these as like, this has to be the case of. Um, you know, this is a human enterprise in ranking tornadoes. And the reason we do it is for studying them. All right, so let's go through the different tornado damages. We're going to work our way up the scale and look at their damage. So F-zeros. A lot of people don't even know F-zeros exist, right? They think it's a 1 to 5 scale. F-zeros exist as well. They do life root damage. They generally break off trees. Um, or if the tornado didn't do any damage, if the tornado just sat in a field, we rate it as an F-zero. So this is pretty exemplary F0 damage. Up at the top here, you can see this mobile home has been de-roofed. And so you'll notice there's a difference between the damage to a mobile home and a well-built home. Um, right? These are both the same level of damage, the same wind speed. You know, up here, this house may not be recoverable, and this house uh, you know, probably is repairable. It's obviously not good if you live there. But you can see it's lifted the shingles. 
and lifted some of the plywood from the roof here off of here. Uh, this house, you know, was a well-built structure, but it has significant damage from the tree falling on it, which is a pretty common occurrence, actually, is the tree damage. Again, I don't want to say these aren't anything. Like, if you live in these houses, this is a pivotal change in your life, right? This is expensive, especially if you don't have insurance. This is, um, you know, at the very least inconvenient and at the very most life-changing. Um, and it can be fatal, although rarely is. And yeah, F-Zero trials, they, they are real things. There are a lot of F-Zero trials. By my quick counts, there have been about 2,500 in Kansas and about 870 in Missouri. So Kansas does get more trials than Missouri, but there's another factor going on, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But you can see most of these are single spots. I want you to look at the trails, and you can see most of these are just dots, right? There are very few that have, like, tracks coming off of them, right? So most F-Zeros, in addition to not doing a lot of damage, don't last that long. But that makes sense, because an F-Zero is based on damage, and if the tornado's not on the ground very long, it's not going to hit very many things, so it doesn't have as many chances to do big damage. So the fact that the tornadoes are weak and short-lived makes sense. If you kind of look at these maps really carefully, you can kind of find some patterns in them as well. But I just want to point out that this is like most tornadoes are F-Zeros, or EF-Zeros more correctly. The E stands for enhanced, by the way. Um, it just means the modern scale, not the one that Dr. Fujita himself made. But if you think about it, one of the reasons that Kansas has so many AFCF zero tornadoes is a lot of Kansas looks like that. And while you might not believe it, most of Missouri doesn't. So this tornado here doesn't look like an F-Zero to me. And I've seen a lot of tornadoes. There's some hints beyond just the like, well, it looks like a pretty big tornado. It, what, what's really catching my eye is this very clean structure up top here, this horseshoe. This, like, really clearly condensed funnel. This, like, symmetric dust flow. This is just clearly not an F-Zero tornado to me. And if you hit something, it would not be an F-Zero tornado. But this tornado, I think Dan Robinson took this picture, uh, didn't hit anything. So this was ranged in F-Zero. And Kansas has a lot of empty fields. And so a lot of tornadoes that would be stronger elsewhere are ranked F-Zero because they don't hit anything. And here the worst damage this is going to do is some corn or these power poles, right? Most F-Zeros, though, in my experience, look like this. I took the picture on the left. The right is just a stock image from the uh, internet. You know, there's these short little kind of wispy tornadoes that are there. I'm not saying every tornado can be judged just by its appearance. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask that and reiterate it. But most of these tornadoes do look pretty weak. You know, uh, again, don't get too hung up on appearances here, but they do. There is a special kind of tornado called a gust nado. So, picture of one here. Uh, these are not technically tornadoes. I'm actually on the camp that we shouldn't call them tornadoes, but they do damage. And so they do get ranked as tornadoes. Uh, whatever, we can talk about how they form if you want. Here's a picture I took of one instead of a picture from the internet, right? It's off to the side. So here's the wall cloud. You can see that, really pretty. Here's the mesocycle on top, and you can see the gust nado to the side. Because it doesn't form from the wall cloud, I don't call them tornadoes. That being said, this gust nado right net here did do damage. You know, if this is your storage building, uh, you're having a bad day. This to me is actually more than F0 damage, and that's a good segue. You can notice the difference here. You know, this is a relatively well-built structure. It's got trusses with reinforcing plates. It's been clad in galvanized steel. You know, this structure looks uh, kind of like a pole barn, right? And so the fact I can see this, like, roof uh, girder here snapped and stuff, this isn't F0 damage anymore. I would count this as F1 damage. And it was ranked F1 damage, if you're wondering. But that doesn't look like a strong tornado, right? Like, it's just a little wispy thing off to the side. Actually, in the field, I didn't even recognize that was there. I had to go back and look at my pictures to see it. In the field, I was very focused on this, you know, obvious wall cloud that looked like it's getting ready to make a tornado and didn't even see this in person until I drove up in the damage. Like, what the heck? Did I miss a whole tornado? And went backwards to figure out what caused it. So that's not surprising. By the way, we've been learning about uh, radar identification of tornadoes. Here's that tornado when it was taken. And this was in 2012, 2011, 2012, I think. You can see how much better radar has gotten even just in the last 10 years. Um... You know, this was the best data that we'd have in the field. This is level three data. You can barely make out the hook echo. You can barely make out the couplet. Like, dang. 
Rare has gotten a lot better. It's gotten a lot easier to chase. But as I said, that was F1 damage, right? So here's more examples of it. You're going to, in a well-built building, start to see like structural cladding damage, like these bricks being knocked out. The reason why this top picture was rated F1 is it's blowing in these exterior doors. That's huge. Uh, down here, these windows being blown in, that's, that's a lot of what's causing the F1 ranking. This is a pole barn down here, like a garage that got destroyed. You know, it's been destroyed, destroyed. Uh, it's not as well built as a house, so it doesn't take as much. Um, how most trials do damage is this. There's like a big garage door or big windows, and they'll blow those in, and now you've got a hole in the side of the structure. The wind can rush in through there, and then it can like get under the roof and start to lift the roof up. And you can kind of see that happening, right? Back here at the back of the house, the roof's okay, but over the garage, the doors were blown in, that's lifted up there. Same thing here. Back side of the structure's in pretty good shape, but the wind came through these windows in this door and lifted the roof off. So in these weaker tornadoes especially, the doors and windows tend to be the way the winds actually get in and cause damage, right? Like, it's not like the wind just blowing on the side of the house knocks it over. I mean, it does in some cases, like a stronger tornado. But like a lot of damage in tornadoes is caused by this structural failure of the windows or the doors. Um, and so your first thought is, well, if I just close the windows really... No, no, no. I mean, remember, windows only last to 114 miles an hour. It doesn't matter what you do. Like, at some point, they're your weak point, And that's what's going to happen. And you could build a house without windows, but... They're really nice every other time besides there's a tornado. This is also F1 damage. Um, you can see this is a mobile home that's been picked up off its foundation and then rolled. I just point out, like, this structure is close to as destroyed as it can possibly be, and anything stronger wouldn't make it. It also shows you that, like, mobile homes are not particularly good things to be in in a tornado. Like, you can see this pole barn in the back has survived pretty well. Um... And so you can see, uh, again, that the structural quality um, plays a role in the tornado's damage. F1s are still very common, but there's been 900 in Missouri and 1,000 in Kansas. If you think about that, Kansas had three times more F0s than Missouri, and here they're more or less equal. Actually, if you look at the spatial distribution, uh, Missouri seems to have more per square mile. If you look at Kansas, you can see some of these have longer tracks. You know, there's a pattern emerging here. But most tornadoes, let's say 70% of tornadoes, are F0s or F1s. All right, so now let's look at some F2s. F2 damage is where things start to get more serious. Um, to me, an F2 is the first thing where you might lose your house if you're living in a permanent structure. To me, F2 tornadoes are the ones where I'm starting to pay attention to them. Like, an F0 or an F1, I might be comfortable getting my car pretty dang close to. An F2? No way. For one, F2s are ranked by the ability to throw a car, so they're the first one that can actually move a car. They're generally where you start to see structural collapses begin to happen, or the removal of roofs. All this is F2. Uh, you also start to see the really significant tree damage out of F2. I think I have a picture of that. Nope. So this is two different F2 damages. Uh, one of the things that I want you to point out here is like instead of like tearing part of the roof off, the roof is just gone. Or in the mobile home, instead of just like rolling it, it's rolled it and shredded it, right? Uh, F2 is is pretty significant. Um, most people remember F2 damage like years after the event. F1 and F0 less. Uh, I want to point this out too. This is a mobile home again, and you can see it's actually sheared it off of its metal foundation here. Really cool to see this, because you can see how the house got rolled one way, and if you look at the trees in the background, they're pushed a different way, so you can really get a good idea of how the winds were just spinning through here violently. And like you can see it actually like twisted this metal. Like you get a little bit more of an idea of dang, this was a pretty strong event and pretty like cataclysmic event. Yeah, when we're talking about F2 tornadoes, they become quite a bit rarer. Uh, again, about equal Missouri and Kansas. You can see these tracks getting longer, which again makes sense. The, the, the longer the tornado's on the ground, the more chance it has to hit things. The more chance it has to hit things, the more chance it has to do large damage. But as you look at these damage tracks and you look at these tornadoes, you know, they're still pretty common like there's going to be f2 tornadoes in missouri and kansas almost every year um really effectively every year i should point out in these maps of like the the trail rankings those are probably over the last about 40 years or so of data so there's not like this is not that long of a story there's a lot of tornadoes in this area like tornadoes aren't incredibly rare um you know there might be a hundred tornadoes between Missouri and Kansas, a hundred to 150 tornadoes between Missouri and Kansas on an average year. 2020 not being an average year, we've had very, very few. Um, 
but uh, you know, most of them are going to be in this EF0, EF1, maybe EF2 case. So most tornadoes, if they hit your house, don't get me wrong, they're dangerous. They're going to do life-changing damage. They might kill you. But they're not that significant. So let's get to the ones that are. At F3, we're dealing with the destruction of the walls of well-built buildings, including masonry walls, brick and concrete walls. Uh, if you're a train on a track, you're really heavy, you're blown off. If you're a tree, instead of being snapped, your bark is getting ripped off. Um, if you're a car, you might get thrown like across the street. Uh, a building without like a basement might get lifted and twisted. Uh, you can see here in this structure, the roof is gone. This brick wall has been falled. Uh, you can actually see like drywall damage to interior walls. Significantly different than the last one. To me, F3 is where we go from minor damage to um, catastrophic damage. You know, obviously there's no hope of rebuilding this house. Uh, there's really, there are spots in this house that like, if you were right where this wall fell, you're dead, right? If you're in this room and this 2x4 comes through at 100 miles an hour, you're, you're dead. Uh, you know, F3 damage is pretty significant. It's what I'm most familiar with in some ways. Um, I really like F3 damage when it comes to trees. They're, they're really interesting things to look at. You can get a really good idea of how the tornado acted when you look at F3 damage. And so, like, here I want to point out, at the bottom is an Alabama tornado. You can see that big, like, wide swath of damage and tree snapping. Uh, if you look really, really carefully, you can see spots where the bark is starting to go away. Or in these oak trees up along top, you can really see how it's just the, the structure left. Um... It looks really different than most tree damage in a storm. F3 damage also is when you start seeing damage in kind of notable ways to industrial structures. Like this is a really well-built building, right? We're talking like poured concrete walls. We're talking like steel girder roof. Uh, and you can see like this concrete wall here has collapsed in. And that's a really common cause of fatalities are on like uh, big box stores like Home Depot or Walmart or whatever. Those big concrete walls like 20 feet tall will fall in and smash everyone inside. That was responsible for a lot of deaths in Joplin. Um, in Enterprise, Alabama is another case. Um, it was a school that killed eight people there. Uh, this is a, a, a pretty rare thing to have happen, to be honest. But when we're getting into these large tornadoes, I mean, you're talking about blowing over concrete walls at F3. So you know we're going to go up from here. Like there's two more stages above here. But I want you to like imagine being in this space when this was hit, and it's it's pretty terrifying to be honest. In general, when you start talking about these larger tornadoes, you can look at them and get the idea that they're stronger. I don't want to again make the misjudgment of uh, saying, okay, well, yeah, but that tornado is not three just because of it. No, you you can't rank a tornado just by what it looks like. But if you look at enough of them, you can kind of get a feeling for, is this a strong tornado or a weak tornado? And, you know, this one, again, being nicely symmetrical, this, yeah, it just, I, it, it's a strong tornado. I, I've seen enough tornadoes. So you can't rank them, but you, you kind of can. Right? And, like, for me, in the field, I know that tornado is stronger when I start seeing these, like, large pieces of debris being thrown. This was an F3. But, like, when I start seeing, like, structural pieces being lofted well above the ground... Um, yeah, you know, I get a pretty good feeling that this tornado is going to have done larger damage. But again, at that point, I'm not just making a, like a visual judgment on the tornado itself. I'm actually saying, look, it's doing damage. So even here, I'm really relying on structures to tell me how strong the tornado is. F3s are rare. Like if you look at them now, I can, I can start picking out individual tornadoes. Um, yeah, and I didn't put the Kansas number there, but it's similar. It's like 150 maybe. Uh, and you can see some of these tracks are extraordinarily long. Um, in general, the stronger the tornado, the longer the track. And again, I hope that makes sense why. All right, let's get into the top 5%. F4 tornadoes. I've personally seen seven of these, I think. Um, they're big. If you're in a house, your house may be gone, gone, uh, including like off its foundation. So like, imagine you're in this basement. The house didn't collapse in on the basement. It just physically got picked up and moved. Um, you can see in the background, those trees really show a different kind of damage than other damage we've seen so far. Uh, cars can be thrown like a thousand feet in this situation. This kind of damage is really different looking still. I hope you can see the difference between this and like an F3. Like we're talking about you're left with more or less the foundation. This is, I think, the classic F4 damage. 
you've got a, a slab foundation, a well-built like masonry pillared building, right? You can see that fence in the background. The, the house has been blown down so much that the debris has no semblance of what it was before, right? You can see like if you were in this building, these like splintered pieces of stud that got thrown into the building, like it's a terrifying situation, right? Anywhere you're in there, you're not, you're not facing particularly good odds of surviving, right? Or certainly surviving without major injuries. This is, when we say to get to the basement, it's because you, you know, compare being here to being in that, right? Stuff still on shelves here. You could, you could hunker yourself down in the corner here and face a real chance of surviving. Here you can't. So I do want to point out, like, there's a reason we say what we say, and it's based on us just seeing enough damage. The difference between F4 and F5 damage is hard to see. So this is F4 damage, too. There are a few hints of it. I think the main hint is that structure to the left. But frankly, it's just because none of these buildings were built well enough to take F5 damage. All of these would have been con completely destroyed at F4 winds, and, and F5 would look no different. So F4 and F5 are pretty sub subjective, making the distinction between them. I mean, if you live here... It doesn't matter if it was an F4 or an F5, right? It does the exact same thing. How rare, we can add up the 80 between the two states. It's actually more like 75 because there's some that cross state lines, right? Uh, and I've seen, you know, a decent number of these F4s on this map. Uh, you can see now that the F4s are concentrated around cities, right? Look, there's a lot more F4s in like Kansas City and St. Louis than there are in the middle. Look, there are a lot of F4s here uh, along the I-70 corridor. Right? Let me go back to that for a second. Right? You can see there are more F4s around like Wichita than there are out here in the edge of Kansas where there's nothing. You see, there's more F4s around Springfield Joplin than around this area. Where if the structures aren't there, they're not going to be F4s. So we're getting to the point where you need big structures to get hit to actually make a tornado. So let's talk about the big ones. The ones everyone wants to talk about. The F5s. Fujita called it incredible damage. And really, F5s are on a different level. Like, the distinction between F4 and F5 is more clear than I think a lot of people make it out. Here's a cinder block foundation. It's been broken into pieces below the ground. In the background, it's hard to see, but the grass has been ripped off the dirt. Let me show you a closer picture of that. This is called scouring. I want you to imagine going outside with your hands, picking up the dirt, like the grass with your hands, and yanking on it, and trying to get dirt out, just by pulling on it. That's what the tornado does. It's insanity, right? This is an F5 damage scar. You can see this is like inches into the ground. Like it's taken the dirt, and then it's taken the grass, and its roots, and it's gotten rid of it all somewhere. It's absolutely insane, right? These ground scours can be really deep. You can actually see them take the pavement off the road sometimes. They're incredible. Now, ground scouring in itself is not only unique to F5s. F4s will do it as well, but some of this really deep scouring like this is a, a pretty rare thing. Uh, meteorologists get all excited when we see this kind of thing. It's like, you know, ground scouring doesn't hurt anyone, right? Like, no one's like disrupted by this and uh, yet it's super cool like come on that's awesome the quintessential look of an f5 is a well-built building being slabbed so this is a well poured foundation with bolts that anchor the structure directly to the foundation you can see these bolts along the outside here there's not a trace of that house anywhere near that house it's just gone that's what we call getting slapped, right? This is a concrete slab. This is an F5. There is a difference. You notice the trees actually still survived the F5. They didn't get uprooted. Uh, trees uprooting is much more about the, the strength of the ground, not the strength of the wind. You can uproot a tree with like 70 mile an hour winds or here like probably 250 mile an hour winds. It still lived. Um, if you look at this though, there is a difference between this and F4 damage. Um, and a lot of people think a lot of F4s should be ranked F5s. It really, they shouldn't. Like, F5s are pretty unique looking damage. This is a truck, like a 
18 wheel tractor trailer, you know that the, the chassis underneath it, right, the steel bar that holds the wheels, right, I'll follow me here with my cursor, you can see the chassis of this truck has been bent in a U around this tree here. In Sandy, like that's 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 box girder steel that has been bent around a tree. Like, holy crap! When Fujita studied atomic bombs and made them linked to tornadoes, it's stuff like this. Hurricanes don't do this. Floods don't do this. Nothing else besides like atomic bombs do this. This is incredible damage. Like, I can't stress how weird this is. And I, these are not the most exemplary damages. I can show you some insane pictures from F5s. I want to show you representative pictures from F5s, like the normal F5 damage, if you will. On the ground, this is the Moore, Oklahoma 1999 tornado. Or it might be the 2013 tornado. Cars look pretty modern. Probably the 2013 Moore tornado. They do look different. Um, you can see this, like, really clear debris field. You can see that inflow jet on the ground, that low cloud deck. They look like F5s. That's one of the reasons why I clearly stand by the base of the tornado, in my opinion, was an F5 at certain points. It just, you could tell. But not always. Remember, you can't always visually tell an F5. This is Canada's only F5 ever. It happened in 2007. It's the Ellie Manitoba tornado. This doesn't look like an F5 for a lot of reasons. It's really tall, like really tall, like disgustingly tall, really skinny, and just doesn't quite have that same debris look at the bottom. We'll look at a video of the Ellie Manitoba tornado in the next class, but um, it doesn't look like an F5. This is a top two or three trail for me. Like This is one of my absolute favorites. It's absolutely gorgeous and absolutely incredible. We'll talk about like why this thing was able to do F5 tornadoes, but like I, I kind of left speechless by this thing. It's, it's so cool. Speaking of gorgeous tornadoes, here's the only F5 in Kansas City's history. It happened in the Ruskin Heights area, I think in 1957. Um, it's gorgeous. You, you know enough about tornadoes now to identify tornado, wall cloud, mesocyclone. Those of you who've heard me kind of talking about the RFD and horseshoe back here, you can see that. This thing is just as textbook as it gets as just being get out of its way. Like, that's big. If I ever see a tornado like that, I would be getting as absolutely close to it as I could, as fast as I could, because that thing is awesome. Like, yeah, this, this person's probably four miles away from that tornado right now, maybe four and a half miles. They are perfectly safe where they are. Um, they are actually in a really good position. They're in the textbook chasing position. Um, yeah, just gorgeous. Uh, Ruskin Heights did that catastrophic damage. You know, you look at these structures, they are slabbed, right? These are well-built structural homes. In the back, you can see these arches of a like a supermarket, you know, structural steel building destroyed. Uh, it did F5 damage along this track. If you put this in modern times, you can imagine the damage an F5 trail through this area would do now would be absolutely insanely catastrophic. Um, it is likely that a trail like this will hit Kansas City again in my lifetime, in your lifetime. Uh, and it will do more damage than it did in 1957 because there are more structures than there were in 1957 even if they're better built. F5s are rare. There have been 10 between Missouri and Kansas, really nine, because the Ruskin Heights tornado here uh, crossed state lines. This Topeka, Kansas tornado that was 1966 down here at the bottom. This was Joplin. Uh, that's the most recent over here. This is Greensburg. It's the second most recent. Uh, these three tornadoes all happened like 1990, 1991. The uh, most famous of them being Andover. We'll look at that tornado video again in the next class. It's really cool. Um, and these tornadoes down here, I admit I don't know much about, but I think they're earlier. We could look them up if we really wanted to. The point being, at this point, I know these tornadoes by name and what they did. Like, they're that rare. Um, you know, it, and you might notice, conveniently, they all seem to kind of go the same direction. Anyway, that, that's kind of cool. Except for Joplin. Joplin was really weird. Uh, there's only been like 60 of these in the whole United States. Um, you can see that they are not as geographically isolated to Tornado Alley as you think. Yes, Oklahoma and Kansas get a lot of F5s, but so does Iowa. Like, a lot. Here's Dixie Alley, this very tight corridor that gets a lot of F5s. And um, those are really happened on two days, one day in 2011, one day in 1973. These are also up here, uh, uh, really kind of one day causing these. So, 
they are more common through this area right here. I want to point out how rare fives are in Nebraska. There's only been one. Right? So really, to my eyes, there's really one, two, and then three areas of persistent F5s. Kind of cool to see. Um, we're getting to the strength where like very specific ingredients need to come together. If we are truly looking for the strongest, meanest tornadoes, it's going to be Kansas and Oklahoma. Um, in meteorology, we believe the most damaging event that is possible would be an F5 trail in the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, kind of megalopolis in that area. Uh, we believe that would be the most damaging tornado event possible. Uh, Chicago also could face an F5, um, which would also be catastrophic, although Chicago seems to get fewer tornadoes as a result of the lake. Um, we, we pretty firmly believe that an F5 in downtown Chicago uh, it doesn't seem likely at this point. And so um, after Dallas-Fort Worth, then Oklahoma City, and then Kansas City is the third most likely metropolitan area to, to see catastrophic F5 damage. So uh, keeping this in mind, like tornadoes, there's a reason why I like to say them living where we live. Okay, so I took all those statistics and I broke them down. So this is my own research. Uh, this is all the tornadoes that have happened in Missouri and Kansas in the period of record, which again goes back to like 1960-ish. Uh, there's been 2,300 in Missouri, 4,200 in Kansas, the difference being mainly EF zeros. At the bottom is the rank by percentage in blue and red in both are EF0 and EF1. So you can see less than 25% on both maps are F2, 3, 4, and 5. F5 uh, basically does not show up. It's a little tiny sliver on each. And you can see by percentages, they're between 0.1 and 0.2%. Okay, Extraordinarily rare. Uh, in terms of F4s, you're still talking, uh, in Kansas at least, less than 1%, and in Missouri, less than 2%. You know, less than 6 or 7% for EF3 or greater. So strong tornadoes are rare, but not impossible. Kind of cool. Uh, very quickly, while we're here, uh, the reason why we, we do rank things is it does turn out that EF4 and F5 do like 75% of the fatalities. So again, we're talking less than 2% of tornadoes causing 75% of the deaths. So if we could find a way to provide warning for F5 tornadoes, um, we'd be well off. I'm going to show you some pictures of an attempt to do that. We have a new kind of tornado warning that actually debuted here in Kansas City or close to it did, I suppose. I think the first one was in Oklahoma City and the second was in Kansas City, I think. I need to check that. One second, I'll be right back. All right, so I'm back. Um, I found the answer to the question and I was a little bit wrong, which is normal enough. So let's take a look at that and finish the video up here. So trial emergencies have been declared 191 times. The first time was Oklahoma City, but Kansas City doesn't show up until one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11 down. Uh, that being said, this list is not perfectly correct. Um, for instance, this tornado here in Kansas City was an F4. I am positive that. I am one of the experts on this tornado. Um, so I'm going to have to go through there and edit that real fast. I don't know if I still have Wikipedia editing privileges, but whatever. I'll fix it. Uh, and I found some other ones in this list that are also underranked. Um, I don't know exactly why someone went through here. Maybe that was the damage when the warning was issued, but the trial certainly has higher. Anyway, besides the point, this language is being tried out. It's been tried out for about the last 20 years and really in the last 10 years, which is when we think there's a stronger tornado, we're going to issue this tornado warning and then put in the middle of it, this is a tornado emergency. Now on the ground, uh, it looks like this. I save all of the times I get a text saying that I'm in the proximity of a tornado. That lets me kind of keep a log of all the times that I've successfully chased a storm. So to the left is some of those texts in my computer. These are from an emergency here in Kansas City last year, the base of the tornado again. And you can see most of them say there's a tornado warning, find shelter, find shelter, you know, check your local media. But then here towards the bottom, it gets a little more like urgent. Find shelter now, right? And the word emergency is capitalized. The language is getting stronger still. Even now this year, the language is you are in imminent danger of death, I believe is how it's now phrased, um, because we're so certain of them. And like a tornado emergency happened last year in uh, Jefferson City, for instance, and it was issued eight minutes before the tornado hit. I want to think about that actually for a moment. If you have eight minutes from the time you get a text on your phone saying, yo, this is the real deal for where you are, to get your butt where you need to be, that's long enough to make a difference. Um, a lot of people say, we, you know, we had no warning. There was no, most of the time you got eight to 10 minutes is the, the general experience, which is actually 
I don't know, pretty pretty good, not to toot our own horns, and uh, quite a quite a few fewer tornado fatalities in the age of cell phones than before. Um, that being said, if you do ever see uh, that you are under a tornado emergency, and you'll know again because your phone will, like an amber alert, go off, and it'll say these words across of it. Really pay attention. The very newest product, which has only been used a few times, is issued by some forecasters in Oklahoma City called the Storm Prediction Center. They're the very best forecasters in the world. And uh, using some computer guidance based on environmental data and like a neural network and things, they can identify in real time a storm that's likely doing F4 or F5 damage. And they'll put out a product that looks like this. It will say, oh, this is exceptionally rare and life damaging. You can see at the top. And we believe based on our best understanding that in you know, this four or five county area, that this area is going to experience F4 to F5 damage. And all that language in the second paragraph is just them supporting that data. And they're saying not only that, they're like, hey, that tornado's ongoing, but downstream for the next hour, it still could be doing this. Remember, F4s and F5s tend to have long damage paths. This product is just being tried out. It's only been done a few times. Uh, but what this would allow your local news station to come online is saying, hey, we got this one on the ground, and we're pretty positive this is going to do catastrophic damage. Like, uh, this was something that happened in the base of Linwood tornado here in Kansas City, for instance, and there were no fatalities from it. And there very likely would have been even a few years ago. And so this kind of thing is the cutting edge of tornado research. Is like, how do we issue these better warnings? Okay, that's a long video. It's a boring video of me looking at pictures and talking. I get it. You're done for today. Do what you want to do for the rest of the day. Next time you meet, we're going to deal with tornadoes themselves. All we're going to do is watch videos of tornadoes. We're going to talk about them. And we're going to look at some structures. It should wrap out our tornado unit, and it should be a much more enjoyable day. I wish I could do this thing with you, but the reality of it is where we fell is uh, among Kairos, and so uh, we'll do it virtually. And the nice thing is it's just watching tornado videos. Once you're done watching those videos, uh, we will uh, do a quick like wrap-up assignment. I'll come back. We'll talk about climate change for a bit, and then we'll move into astronomy. So uh, pretty straightforward. Um, until then, I hope you have a great day. See you on Thursday or Friday. Ciao.